cold, so I think he'll be more comfortable. I just hope, just pray that it doesn't rain. Okay. Um, again, I say good morning to all of you. A very warm welcome to you at the Z Japan Literature Festival 2014. This is the Google Mughal tent. Like yesterday, we're going to have full sessions all day. Today, we actually have session till 7 o'clock. So here we present our first session, The Way of Knife. Let's welcome Mark Mazzetti, Barnett Rubin, Adrian Levy, Ben Anderson, and the session will be moderated by Jason Burke, and this is presented by Hindustan Times. Ready, we all mic'd up, good. It's a select audience on this freezing morning. Um, it's a really good venue, this one, the Moogle tent, because you can actually see people and talk to people. And uh, I know that the, my four, four panelists will be talking a lot. They're all immensely knowledgeable people. Mark Mazzetti is a Pulitzer winning reporter for the New York Times. It's his book we're primarily discussing, The Way of the Knife. It's a fantastic in-depth account of the, the, the evolution of the CIA's understanding of lethal violence, surgical, supposedly surgical lethal violence, as a key component in the American war against, counter -ter uh, against terrorism or counter-terrorist effort. I have Barney Rubin, who, whose work uh, on Afghanistan is globally known, uh, uh, fantastically respected, fantastically knowledgeable on Afghan and Pakistani affairs, advisor to numerous governments, US, Afghan and others. Adrian Levy, veteran investigative reporter, old friend of mine from days in South Asia, long, long time ago, published, uh, published a series of brilliantly written and perceptive and rigorously researched books, most recently The Siege, about the November 2008 attacks in Mumbai, and Ben Anderson, who is bringing a little bit of kind of street credibility to this otherwise, uh, let's say, more mature gathering of journalists who spend a little less time on the ground these days. Uh, ben, who's been in and out of Afghanistan for five or six years, out in the trenches, in the firing line, and can tell us exactly what's happening at a tactical level in hell holes like Sangin, uh, Marja, elsewhere in what is still, often forgotten, is still a war ongoing in Afghanistan. To start, I want to ask Mark just to explain to us a little bit about what the way of the knife really means and how the CIA and US policy got to the point where the consideration that we're, we're effectively killing people as civilians, an intelligence service, killing people a long way away became a principal, if not the principal, part of a global counter-terrorist strategy. How did that happen? Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, it's terrific to be here. Uh, it's a great honor to be on this stage with 
um, this panel, and my first time in Jaipur, so um, uh, uh, I've only been here about 12 hours, so so far so good. Um, but I, um, uh, to, to, to start, I guess, I just maybe to explain the title of my book, um, it's, it comes from, as I write in the, the prologue of the book, um, it's sort of a metaphor, it comes from a speech given by now CIA Director John Brennan, who was describing the, um, the, the, the approach that the Obama administration takes um, in contrast to what the Bush administration did with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And what he said was um, the, the uh, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were the hammer, uh, and uh, what the Obama administration chooses instead is a scalpel. Uh, implying this very clean and surgical form of, um, of warfare um, that, um, as I write, implies um, sort of surgery, surgery without any complications. Um, I chose actually um, knife instead of scalpel because knife fights tend to be a lot messier, bloodier, and um, I thought it was far too much of a euphemism to call something a scalpel. Uh, but I used it to sort of encapsulate what I thought was a way of looking at um, this, this sort of shadow wars that have been carried out since 9-11. Um, a, a fair amount has been uh, written about, and still continues to be written about Iraq and Afghanistan, and I thought the contours of, the, of those wars by this point were, were somewhat well known, but so, um, so little about the wars in Pakistan, uh, in Yemen, in parts of Africa were known, and that's why I decided to, to, to write the book. Um, as Jason said, it's, it's uh, very much focused on the CIA as being um, the sort of central, uh, uh, the, the machine behind these secret wars. Uh, right after 9-11, the, the CIA was put in fr at the forefront of these wars outside of declared war zones. And this has led to this real transformation of the agency um, from what was uh, an, an intelligence and espionage, intelligence gathering and an espionage service um, toward uh, what is basically a paramilitary service now uh, charged with um, lethal targeted killing. Um, that has become the uh, preferred method of choice, as Jason said, by, um, by the Obama administration. Um, and, uh, and, and it remains, despite pledges uh, by President Obama for greater transparency, it remains very much a secret. And in part, that's because it, it, it's a, the whole idea of the surgical strike is a response to the messiness and the, and the inchoate violence, the indiscriminate violence of the Bush era, particularly in terms of the CIA's techniques. I'm thinking about very controversial techniques that, that were controversial both within the agency and outside the agency. Rendition and so forth, interrogation techniques, waterboarding and right. everything we know about. So it's a response to a couple things. And, and, and besides being a response to the big wars of invasion and occupation like Iraq and Afghanistan, um, the CIA methods that it has embraced um, really primarily since around 2008, that of targeted killing, are a response to um, some of the methods uh, embraced early on by the CIA after 9-11, which are familiar to, to everyone, I'm sure, uh, uh, waterboarding, um, some of the, 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 the um, interrogation detention methods that have been widely uh, condemned as torture um, and created so much so many problems for the CIA. Um, as I write about in the book, um, there is this moment when um, the CIA began to see uh, killing um, as a far cleaner, less controversial, um, and, and more politically palatable solution uh, than capturing an interrogation. Um, and partly because the CIA agents themselves, operatives themselves, were worried about legal, some kind of legal comeback, potentially. So um, uh, w w one of the things I write about in the book, and I get into some of the history of the CIA, with, which, which has this uh, very uneasy relationship with killing, and there's, uh, there is a, um, uh, uh, there's a, a cyclical history with the CIA. Those of you who know the history of the CIA know that in the early decades, um, there was um, a, a good deal of focus on the paramilitary operations um, by the CIA. Uh, coup attempts, assassination plots, all those were aired out in the 1970s. Um, then um, this, there was a, a period of retrenchment after all of this sort of dirty laundry got aired out. Um, and then um, the CIA basically was out of the business of killing for some time until after 9-11 when they were given this, um, this lethal order. But Jason, to your direct point, um, there was a great deal of legal concern about the implications of torture, the, the interrogation methods, and what the CIA and to some degree the Defense Department found as well is that there was far less 
legal controversy for killing than there was for interrogation. And at the same time, the Department of Defense, who are the guys who are meant to be doing the killing, are developing an intelligence wing, or a, a great, greater, great, a more greatly enhanced intelligence capacity. One of the things you're talking about in the book is, is how you end up with a civilian agency that is killing and a military institution that is developing all sorts of intelligence capacities at the same time. And those, those elements don't always, or very rarely actually, come together. And one of the times they do all come together, and the whole machine works, is the raid that killed Bin Laden. But that, it, that was an exception in, in many ways. So there's an awful lot of bureaucratic infighting in your books. It's not a smooth no. policy-making process. I think from outside, people have this image of the, of the CIA and the American security establishment as something that is incredibly focused, effective, efficient, cold, uh, and capable. But actually, it seems a bit of a mess. Well, it, it, Barney, he, Barney spoke, you know, was, was on the inside of that machine at one point, so, so he can talk about how, how, sm how, how smoothly it operates. Uh, um, but, the, um, but that's exactly right. So the shorthand, is, in a way, is that over the last 12, 13 years, the CIA has become start, starting to look a lot more like the military, and the military has come to look a lot more like the CIA. Shortly after 9-11, Donald Rumsfeld, <coughs> the then Defense Secretary, was furious that this war um, was going on around the world, and he didn't think he could wage it with his legal authorities, with his troops, so, and with the intelligence gathering capabilities that the Pentagon had at the time. So he begins this drive to basically expand the definition of a battlefield um, to include the whole world, and also expand his abilities to go spy. And um, before 9-11, there were more clearly demarked lines between what soldiers do and what spies do. And um, what we've seen over the last 12 years is such a blurring of the lines that where you get, for instance, in the, in the Bin Laden operation, which is certainly um, a, an, a case study of it working very well, is you have a military force going into a country where the United States is not officially at war, and in fact, an allied country, um, and it, the entire operation carried out by the military was put under CIA authority. So um, it's somewhat of a distinction without a difference these days uh, what the military does and what the spies do. Barney, do you want to follow up what Mark mentioned there in terms of the policy making? I mean, we do have this, this image outside of almost you know, the president as the, the, the sitting in his, in his big swivel chair making phone calls and wiping somebody out or ordering a division from here to there, uh, that kind of extreme executive ability and a capability on the part of the US policy making establishment that maybe from inside that image doesn't quite represent what's going on. Is that fair? I mean, what's it, what, from, from inside, is it a complete mess? Or is it <laughs> beautifully organized, or is it a kind of haphazard mixture of the two? Well, well, let me, I'll start by just echoing Mark and saying I'm pleased to be in Jaipur. This is not my first time in Jaipur. The first time I was in Jaipur, which is also the last time I was in Jaipur, I, uh, I heard all, all India radio make an announcement as follows. America ke rashtrapati Richard Nixon ye, ne apna tyag patra de dia. <laughs> so, uh, which for those of you who don't know Shud Hindi means uh, the President of the United States, Richard Nixon, has submitted his resignation. Uh, so that's why I have whiter hair than these gentlemen here, but it's a uh, pleasure to be back in Jaipur. Um, now, I was in the government, but I was not inside that part of the government, and I had no, uh, I had no ability to see what was going on inside that. What I saw, what, what I was involved in was diplomacy, and in fact, uh, attempting to start a peace process between, uh, with the Taliban on one side and U.S. government and Afghan government and others on the other side. And <clears throat> what I observed was that there's an extremely difficult problem of trying to make peace when you're at war, which, by the way, is the only time that you do it. Um, <laughs> and that is that there's always the danger that you may end up killing someone you're trying to talk to. So that, that's the problem of, of deconfliction. But it's a, very, it's a bigger political issue. And let me go back and kind of put it in a policy perspective. In 2008, I was, uh, I, I was something called a, an advisor on the Obama campaign, <coughs> which is, a, 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 
I, I did give advice, but uh, I mean, no one actually took my advice or listened to it. But it, it, um, and at one point, the campaign issued a, a statement about Obama's policy on Pakistan in particular. And I read it, and it, clearly it was a list. Each point had been written separately by a different person, and then they had been assembled. And two of the points were, one, um, if, if, when he is president, uh, B President Obama will hit the terrorists wherever they are found, um, wh whether the Pakistan government is willing or able to go after them or not. And the other point was that the U.S. would engage with um, the democratically elected government of Pakistan and civil society in order to try to <coughs> strengthen institutions and promote uh, civilian control over the military and so on. So I wrote a brief email to uh, Susan Rice, who is today the president's national security advisor and at that time was the head of foreign policy saying, I can understand the logic behind each of these two points, but the more you do the first one, that is strike the terrorists wherever they are, regardless of what the government of Pakistan said, the less you will be able to do the second one. Um, and uh, I, I don't remember her answer at, at any rate. Um, but the uh, result, you know, his, the experience since then has amply borne that out. Um, but let me explain to you why that uh, problem hasn't been solved from the point of view of a policymaker. Now, of course, when you are, uh, I'm where I'm in, I'm in India now, and we are all clearly not from India. Um, and uh, also, I note it's a predominantly female audience, and you may note that is not characteristic of the panel. Um, uh, so there are asymmetries of power in the world. However, the President of the United States is not elected to question asymmetries of power. He is there to exercise them. So all of what we are discussing is within that context. You're, and of course, you are welcome to question those asymmetries of power, but in this panel, we're not questioning them. We're talking about how they work. Um, so from the point of view of the President of the United States, uh, his number one job is to protect American citizens especially to protect them in the United States. And September 11th was a huge shock. It's one thing to see it on television. I saw it in person. I was in New York that day. Um, and it's a political shock. And it's not just that the president has a tremendous sense of responsibility. He also has a tremendous sense of political vulnerability um, because there are people out to get him. And any incident in which Americans are killed will be used against the president and his party. And we, and we saw that in uh, the K incident in Benghazi, Libya, where four U.S. Uh, <coughs> diplomats and security workers were killed. And it led to a huge scandal over essentially nothing. Um, and, you, and, you, and you can imagine what would happen if there were a repeat, even a smaller repeat of something like 9-11. So, from the point of view of the president, he, he understands, I think he understands perfectly well that um, in the long run, um, the, a, a more sustainable way of dealing with terrorism is to work with the societies where uh, terrorism has taken root, help deal with some of the problems. There is a, dis a distinction, of course, between, and here's a problem with definition, between terrorism as a small conspiratorial group without much of a social base, which is what Al-Qaeda was when it was founded, and that was the nature of the Al-Qaeda that attacked the United States, and a political military movement that uses terrorism as part of its uh, tools of, of warfare. And it, it happens that the former type of organization can operate much more easily in the context of the latter, right? So that Al-Qaeda found it easier to operate in Afghanistan together with the Mujahideen or the Taliban, not because the Mujahideen or the Taliban shared its international agenda, both of them had a local agenda and local roots, 
but because it provided an atmosphere in which they could do that. So the president may be trying longer term things like a peace process in Afghanistan, help uh, democratic institutions stabilize in Pakistan, but if there's an attack that hits the United States from that area, he will not be able to do that anymore because his hand will be forced. And I, I was in the government, one time I witnessed this, in um, whenever it was, 20, fall of 2010, when Shahzad, a, a Pakistani would, Times Square, Times Square uh, uh, failed to set off a suicide bomb in Times Square. Because he failed to set it off, uh, there were no reprisals. But President, as reported by Secretary Gates in his recent book, President Obama told uh, the leadership of Pakistan very clearly that if he had succeeded uh, in setting that bomb off, even he, the President of the United States, would not have been able to control the reaction. So um, therefore, uh, in addition to which, the results of drone strikes are quantifiable, and you can, you can see them. You can't prove that they're effective in the long run, but you can prove that you've done something. The effects of a policy that is supposed to work in the medium to long term are not quantifiable. You, can't pr you uh, don't have evidence. And that is one of the reasons that military action of whatever type is always more attractive than political or diplomatic action, because you can easily show that you're doing something. Um, so what has happened now is, our, uh, to some extent, what President Obama also said about uh, surveillance, our capabilities have captured our strategy. Um, uh, precisely because of the nature of the network threat that the United States is facing. Just leaping directly from the policy making end of things, and I mean what you're saying, Barney, is, or emphasizing is to what extent the president is re very often reacting directly to an immediate pinpoint, if you like, event and thus being distracted both by that and by the capabilities that he has uh, available, the tools that are available, from anything that might be more productive in the long term. Ben, who's, you've been at the receiving end, if you like, of that, or right down on the ground with the troops in Marja, the Americans in Marja, again in, in Sangin. Um, one of the things you mentioned in, in uh, your book that I thought was really striking um, was how, for example, there'd been a debate, a long debate about the length of t tours that people should be serving, that soldiers should be serving. So ideally, you have people who are in country, learn the ground, make the contacts, understand what's going on, stay for long enough to actually start achieving something, if they're going to achieve anything. Um, what you show is that actually you spend time with one American platoon that suffered heavy casualties and you describe the men there on the ground as hollowed out, which I thought was a wonderful turn of phrase. Um, how much does this demand of these human beings, these 19 year olds who end up on the ground? I mean, when I spent time with them, I always felt that they were as much victims as anybody else. Many of them didn't want to go there. They were there for, because they wanted to get through college and are seen often as as the, the sort of the sharp end of the, the commandos of the evil empire or whatever. Yeah. Actually, the reality is rather different, yeah. no? Yeah, a lot of them do want to go out there and fight. I mean, one, one person was very young and volunteered after 9-11, knowing full well it would be sent to, to Hel Helmand province. And I asked him, why? Because you used to get told 9-11 was the reason a lot of people signed up. Sometimes people signed up for college or financial reasons. But, but one guy said to me, I wanted a shot at the title. Uh, in other words, the Taliban were famous as being these, you know, some of the best guerrilla fighters in the world, and he wanted to test his fighting skills against them. So a lot of them went out there with, with very romantic ideas of what the war would be like. The reality was walking around on either baking hot or freezing cold patrols, uh, never, literally never seeing the enemy. <clears throat> Occasionally seeing a muzzle flash from a rifle or a bit of dust, um, and far more often seeing someone step on an IED and, and lose their legs. I mean, that happened... The battalion you mentioned before <coughs> had 25 people killed, 140 seriously injured. And seriously injured was um, double, triple, or a few quadruple amputees. Um, and that was happening almost daily. So there was an idealism at the beginning. And, and there was a belief that, that, that they were fighting the people who were behind 9-11. By 2010, to that, 2011, I didn't hear 
anybody say that. And how much did they actually understand about where they were? I mean, about the, about the people around, not just, perhaps not the, the soldiers who are out carrying the, you know, whatever, uh, doing the patrols, but maybe their NCOs or the, or the junior officers or even above that. Uh, how many people actually understood where they were, what they were doing, who they were interacting with, the dynamics of the local population? I mean, you, me you mentioned Sangin. Sangin was one of the first places I went to with the British soldiers in 2007, and, and they used to hold shuras, and they'd learnt this word shura, which they thought meant they understood the culture and they could get people together. And a shura is when opposing forces get together and have a discussion and come to a consensus. When the Brits or, or Americans um, held a shura, they would lead it. And they would just talk for an hour and then take a few questions at the end. So they're completely misunderstanding the, the, the point of, of the shura in the first place. But in 2007, they were asking questions. Who's the local Malik? Which tribe is most prominent here? Which tribe is, is traditionally pro-government? Which tribe is traditionally pro-Taliban? I, I went back to Sangin several times over the last six, seven years. And I was there just before Christmas last year and saw the US Marine officers asking exactly the same questions. Um, and that's not just a problem between British and Americans, even within marine units, there's such rivalry that even if the intelligence is shared very well, um, the, the unit who are coming in dismiss it and say, you mess things up, we're going to have a much bigger, better operation. And also, another problem I found was not only each, each unit seemed to be essentially starting from scratch, but also each unit, because it's their six months tour of Afghanistan, they want medals. They want a big military operation, even if it makes no sense whatsoever to have a big military push in that area. That's what they want to do within their six-month tour at some point. So they'll find an excuse to launch a big military operation. And that, that, that just increased the sense that, that every six-month cycle was exactly the same. Um, and nothing was being learned for, from the previous just years. Jason, can I briefly yeah, I want to come over to you on that volume. Okay. Yes, please. Well, look, I once had a discussion with uh, someone in the White House. He's still in the government, so I won't say who he was. But he was telling, this was during the last days of the Bush administration. And he said, We've got this database now on the tribes, and anybody can access it so they can figure out where they are and who's who and so on. And I just said to him, any strategy that requires US military officers to understand Afghan tribal politics is a strategy that will fail. Uh, because whatever little assortment of factoids, even if they're accurate, they manage to assemble, they have no framework to understand it. That's why they can't transfer it because there, it, doesn't mean, it doesn't really mean anything to them. So um, essentially, uh, you know, one of you was saying it was you, that you just talked to a Pakistani general who said that SWAT was a very successful counterinsurgency operation. Mm -hmm. You, okay. I don't know if it was or it was not, but there's a fairly decent chance that a Pakistani military officer might understand the society of Pakistan. Although if he's a Punjabi and SWAT, maybe he won't. But <coughs> there is, uh, and, and of course, He's not in there to then transfer authority from his country to some other government. You know, counterinsurgency by a foreign force really doesn't work very well. And it, it's, a, it's a colonial doctrine which does not transfer well to the era of sovereignty. Well, the, the Pakistani generally said that, that, that their motto when they went into Swat Valley was, we're fighting the enemies of Allah. Which, of course, is something an American military could, could never say. And I said, if it's true what you say, you were so successful in four months, could a foreign army do this anywhere? And he said, no chance. So, yeah, I agree. The, the, the CIA have, nonetheless, considerable... Uh, or do they? I mean, there, there have been some CIA people I've met who've really impressed me, uh, who get most of this, who understand most of this, who work quite hard at working out local dynamics, do their best to become knowledgeable. Language skills are an issue, certainly. It may just be that, as Barney says, it's just impossible. It's just not going to happen. But where are those people in the organization? Where have they been in the last few years? Have they just been completely sidelined? Are they now coming back? Is it, I mean, you're kind of sort of optimistic that there's a shift back in that direction. But it's very unclear at the moment, particularly the direction from the White House and the, and the, and the 
the, the, the desire to use the drone so intensively? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, actually, I don't know how optimistic I am that there's, that there's a shift back. I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens. The, uh, Brennan, the CIA director, has said that um, with the, the CIA's focus on this manhunting and killing mission, um, it has atrophied the, um, the sort of regular, um, the capabilities of the CIA to do analytical work, to do uh, as classic espionage, intelligence gathering. Um, those people are at the CIA. I mean, there, it, it's, it is still, for the most part, um, uh, you know, it's less than a majority of the CIA is focused, uh, uh, far less than a majority is focused on hunting and killing people. But at the same time, when that is the primary mission that the agency does, it, um, and the primary mission that it, the White House wants the CIA to do, it sucks up the time of the highest level people at the agency. And, um, and so many people in the service start seeing that as their ticket for advancement. Um, th this generation of CIA officers who've come in since 9-11 um, have because in part that's where the mission has taken them, but also because that it's been seen internally that that is the way to advance, have gone into this kind of work, this counterterrorism work, um, which is, I mean, the, the counterterrorism center at the CIA, as I write in, in the book, um, was a kind of small, somewhat fringe element of the CIA, of the CIA's directorate of operations before 9-11. Um, it is now the beating heart of the CIA. Uh, it's grown exponentially, um, and it has sort of consumed the, consumed the agency. And, and one of the things you mention, um, and this takes us into areas where, Adrian, you have deep expertise, is how it's not just the, the, the CIA core, uh, it's contractors as well. And I'm thinking particularly about in Pakistan, where there's this extraordinary creation of a parallel spy, this enormous, huge spy network in Pakistan, often involving all sorts of shady characters with all sorts of, some of whom are CIA, some of whom are connected to CIA. So, I mean, it's all very opaque and oddly in a, in a supposedly, ostensibly allied country that the CIA decided to treat as hostile. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the CIA and ISI relationship could be a subject of an entire panel, because we could spend hours, um, and it's a fascinating subject, and, and, and the, the, this, this sort of dysfunctional relationship between these two spy service, services is, is just the post-9-11 history is fascinating. But very, very briefly, um, what you began to see over time, as I relate in the book, is this breakdown. There was never trust between the two services, but by around 2000, six, seven, eight, um, there was um, really hostility between the two services. And um, President Bush, in, in the middle of 2008, basically decided to make the American war in Pakistan unilateral and do drone strikes without consulting the Pakistanis first. And um, in, 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 at the same time, in parallel, the CIA really was escalating the number of its operatives in Pakistan that it was not telling the Pakistani government about. So the CIA was creating this sort of secret army inside of Pakistan. And and the Pakistanis and the, and the ISI in particular uh, were, were sure this was going on, but they couldn't prove it. And it wasn't until January 2011 when a man named Raymond Davis is driving through the streets of Lahore um, and um, he thinks he's being robbed uh, and he uh, ends up shooting two, uh, two men who he thought were trying to rob him who had guns. Uh, and a series of very, very unfortunate events happen, and, uh, and, and Davis ends up in jail. Um, eventually, the Obama administration had to, had to admit that he worked for the CIA after first denying it, and this became such a big deal, and it was only after going to Pakistan to report for the book that I realized just how big a deal it was in Pakistan, overshadowing so much else, um, was because it was the proof that Pakistan had long wanted that the CIA had sort of deployed this army. The, the, one of the key characters in, in your book, Adrian, is David Headley, who uh, is an, an extraordinary figure in sort of Southwest Asian espionage, if you like. Uh, a, a double, possibly triple agent working for, we know the ISI, we, or certainly trained by the ISI, contact with the ISI, also probably DEA, Drugs Enforcement um, Agency in the US, possibly other US agencies, and all the time involved with Lashkar Toiba and then break-off groups from Lashkar Toiba. Tell us a little bit about 
him and particularly his role in Mumbai, which the, the 2008-26-11 attacks? Everyone will have to excuse me, I'm fighting jet lag desperately, so I'm going to try and be coherent and awake at the same time. Um, Headley um, is an extraordinary um, maverick, chameleon kind of figure. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen that picture of him with the mismatched eyes. Um, he came from an extraordinary heritage, his mother a Maryland heiress, his father a um, noted broadcaster from Lahore. Um, a love match that came together in Washington DC and this boy is produced who then would spend his youth in Lahore and other places in Pakistan um, and then come back to, um, uh, come back to uh, New York and run a business in the Upper West Side. Someone who could be convincing um, in Pakistan and convincing um, in American society. Um, and something that he manipulated, a, uh, a dual nationality he manipulated from his earliest years um, when he decided um, around the early 80s to begin dealing drugs. But to come to that question of, um, of, of him as an asset and who he served, um, Headley right from the beginning served himself. And I think that's the clearest thing when you actually look at the trajectory of this individual. Uh, the only person he was ever interested in was himself. And that might be to do with his um, lack of a sense of self. That's what his mother said about him. His lack of a defined uh, being led to him becoming um, uh, someone who searched for a purpose and rewards. Um, and um, Headley... Um, uh, was a drug dealer who betrayed the friends who were around him um, and then immediately um, he was caught, gave up the syndicates by serving the DEA. Um, immediately that game was stepped up, um, he offered his services as the political scene changed to the American intelligence community uh, come 1998 when Al-Qaeda had struck in, um, in Africa destroying the two US embassies. Um, he offered a way of penetrating the opaque world of Islamism by using his Pakistan heritage. Um, and then uh, post 9-11, that became equally attractive because at that time he may well have been the only American passport holder who could say with any credibility that he could move towards Osama bin Laden, which meant that um, he was enticing, uh, bewitching, um, um, a sociopath who was convincing in a room, difficult to control, and at the same time an attractive proposition if you're an intelligence agency. Um, and he did, in fact, by 2006, wheedle his way um, into the heart of uh, Lashkar Toiba, the Army of the Pure, who were responsible for the Mumbai attack. And, of course, he also had cozied up to the ISI, who were giving him training, and seems, uh, from court documentation and other information, to still have been having many fingers in American intelligence pies within, broadly within the, um, the intelligence community. And yet no one is really sure who he serves at that time and who he's, uh, who he's part of. And a, a lot of what we know about the... F the evolution of the Mumbai plot is based on his testimony. Uh, I mean, there are lots of other, there's, there's plenty of other sources, but his is, a, is a certainly a key element of it, particularly in terms of who within the ISI he was dealing with. There's this major Iqbal type who's never been properly identified. Mm. But it, it goes straight to the critical question of how much did the ISI know about that operation? Did, was it a Pakistan intelligence sponsored operation? Was it a operation they knew about and let run was an operation that certain elements within the, in the organization knew about and let run how did that break down yeah i've been asking myself that question every day since i began researching the book i mean the isi is like a ball of ball of wool you know i mean it's not uh, it's not as coherent or easy to define and um of course um the jihad organizations are chock-a-block full of ex-servicemen who may or may not be retired or may not be ex um, ex-intelligence officers who may or may not be retired and therefore the ambiguity is built into the organisation, it's built into Lashkar Toiba and it's difficult to know where the state ends and the jihad begins. And that manipulation, that ambiguity, uh, you know, was instilled from the days of Zia al-Haq in 1979. It was then enhanced to use as an internal repression within Pakistan against minority communities, uh, the campaigns against Shias, Shia landowners, against Christians. Uh, the, the launch of sectarian organisations that were fronts for, internal, uh, for the internal security, like Sipa al Sahaba, other uh, extreme sectarian outfits, and it's manifest in this operation in Mumbai. Undoubtedly, elements of the intelligence establishment were linked to David Headley. We know that from him, we know that from other independent um, uh, intercept information, and from the interrogation of other people who were involved peripherally uh, in the operation. Um, and another interesting facet on this ambiguity 
And uh, it's something I only really realised doing this book. Um, I went to see uh, some uh, fantastic um, investigators who work um, in the civilian intelligence uh, agencies, small, underfunded, and a minority outfit in Pakistan. And um, I was asking them about various sectarian jihad fronts, and they talk about them encyclopedically. If you want to know about Sipa al-Sahaba, they can tell you everything, the genesis, the key operators. Ask them about al-Qaeda, bomb-making in Miram Shah. They'll identify nine different factories and you know, the difference in the production of those bombs and ordnance and how that came about. Ask them about Lashkar al-Toiba. Nobody knows anything. And the reason is it's a facet of the state. And as a, you know, a, a manifestation of the state, no one was allowed to investigate it. Therefore, there is no data bank. There's no understanding of its genesis, the evolution of its philosophy, of the Hadithi philosophy. And, and this, this actually demonstrates to you how embedded Lashkar is within the apparatus of the state. And therefore, once you know that, and once you're being told that by veteran 30-year career investigators inside Pakistan, then you begin to ask yourself how the state could not have known about some manifestations of the Mumbai plan. I'd say it, it must have known. It's impossible that it didn't, although there's no one smoking gun. You know, we look at the trajectory of Lashkar Atoyba, of David Headley and his relationship to, uh, to those outfits. But can I just swivel this around a little bit and take it back to some of Mark's territory just briefly? Yeah, sure. Um, one, another element of this is how much did the CIA know? How much did American intelligence know? Because there's a way in which David Headley, of course, is blowback. You know, Headley is the alluring uh, bait. Uh, he climb, clambers into the jihad. He's fighting for the intelligence agencies in America and for himself and for Lashkar Atoyba. And um, the intelligence that he's gathering is packaged up and sent from 2006 onwards back to India. Mm. And we've read that intelligence. You know, the bulletins are extraordinary and they write. Very precise as well. Really, really precise. About the boat, about the yeah. marine landing, Stuff exactly that where. Stuff only he could know. Yeah. As he conceived the ideas, he sold it back to the uh, American agencies who shored it of its identifying factors and gave it to RAW, the um, external intelligence, who then passed it to IB and then it went through its nose down to the state. So 2006, they identified Lashka's plotting Mumbai would be a target. That's the first bulletin. Um, Headley um, had come up with that plan. It had been accepted by the Shura briefly as a, as a plan. Um, when it was decided it was a marine landing, that bulletin was dispatched. Headley's not attached to these bulletins. Um, and that percolates through the intelligence apparatus. Every target would be named. Everything apart from the Jewish target, uh, Nariman House, Chabad House. Instead, they said a Jewish community center. So you have the assimilation of intelligence being passed back by Headley via RAW and IB, but no one in India would know the source of the intelligence is so maybe no one could prioritise it. So that's an interesting relationship and a dynamic as well. There's one final question, then we'll go to, to Ben and we'll go to, to <coughs> the floor. Um, one thing we haven't spoken about, which is an, an, an integral part of the intelligence game, if you like, this, this game of shadows, is that the militant organisations, the extremist organisations, the terrorists, have their own intelligence organizations uh, and it's not quite as simple as that as for passive recipients yeah. of, or, of, all, of all this effort from, from the West or from RAW or from whoever. Um, the Taliban run an intelligence outfit, don't they? Is it in any way effective or does it just, and the spies that they hang relatively frequently, are they genuine spies or is it just used as a, a way of keeping populations under control? I, mean, I think the Taliban's own intelligence network is very good simply because people in the south of Afghanistan are, are pragmatic. Um, they know that the US Marine or British soldier that, that, that they're meeting with every day for, for tea is gone in six months. Um, they know that the Afghan government official they're dealing with is spectacularly corrupt. Um, the army, who I think are probably the most positive story out of what we've done in Afghanistan is, is the, the progress of the Afghan National Army. They're from the north, often don't even speak the same language. The Taliban are from the, the, the village that the operation is taking place in. It's, and if I was living in, in Helmand, I, no matter what I was offered, no matter how many schools or mosques were rebuilt or irrigation ditches repaired, I, I wouldn't pick sides. I would cooperate with, with whoever happened to be at my front door at that particular time. So for that reason, it's very, intel very easy for them to gain lots of intelligence. And secondly, I think, you know, e even if the entire operation in Afghanistan, our, our operation, went perfectly well, the point of it is to hand over to the Afghan government and its security forces, who in the south are hated and feared. By, by many people, and, 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 for, and for good reason. I've, I've seen the police behave 
appallingly in, in, in the South. So, so I think people would, would willingly give information to, to the Taliban. And you, know, you always hear stories about cash rewards given for, for intelligence and tip-offs. I, I haven't actually seen any evidence of that, and I don't think people need cash rewards. I think people willfully give, give information to the, to the Taliban. But can I just very, 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 very quickly, quickly, everybody, and then we'll yes, go to super quickly. Yeah, which, um, um, you know, jihad uh, has um, lessons learned, and it has that facility. I mean, I've actually seen that facility work with Lashkar Toiba, and it works a lot more effectively than the state. You know, they film every attack, they, they look at a Fidayeen operation, they study it, and then they improve. Gentlemen, same going on within the Western US intelligence community. Reaction, lessons learned. Well, in terms of the, uh, the, the jihadi or, or, or other intelligence serv uh, operations going on, I mean, the most successful uh, uh, from the Al-Qaeda side, was, uh, in terms of planting someone and get, getting someone inside the CIA, was the, was the operation in late 2009 at Camp Chapman in Afghanistan, uh, where they basically had a double agent. Um, they, the CIA had suspected that um, they, they had penetrated Al-Qaeda, um, and we're, we're going to get to Ayman Zawari, the number two, now the number one of Al-Qaeda. Um, and it turns out he, he was playing them the whole time, gets into the base, blows himself up, and seven, I believe seven CIA employees were killed in that operation. So that is an example of a very successful operation that turns on, turns on the intelligence service. Yeah. Well, it's a very asymmetrical problem because the, uh, the Taliban, who, again, are an organization that is part of the society, on both sides of the Afghan and Pakistan border. It doesn't mean they're supported by a majority, but they are part of the society. Their intelligence is about their society, uh, primarily. So they have good access to that. Their uh, ability to analyze political facts about the US decision-making process, I have the impression, is quite limited. Uh, it's perhaps even inferior to the ability of the US to analyze the Taliban decision-making process. However, that is much less consequential for them. Uh, because they're operating uh, locally. Good points. Thank you very much. Uh, questions, keep them short, keep them questions. Uh, no monologues, please. Um, and I'll take a few at once and then we'll try and answer as many as we can. Yes. Uh, is question, this please. My question is, is this panel is of the view that the US wants that, it, that in some country or the other, like Afghanistan, Syria, or some other there is always some war is going on all the time so that American economy remains in good shape because defense industry is a big part of U.S. economy and it could export armaments. Okay, thank you. Um, who's deciding? Front on the right down here. Some talk about uh, capability defining strategy. I think Rob said something along the way. President Obama said that our st capability has come to decide our strategy. Now, shouldn't that always be the case that capability should decide strategy? I mean, if you go beyond your capability in deciding a strategy, things maybe won't work out very well. Very good. Final one. We're down at the front. Oh, Anita, and then we'll go back to the on the on the no on the left here. Just lady with her hand up, and then we'll go to the back up for the next round. Uh, well, this is, the, uh, is not an Afghan shura, but more uh, perhaps one which resembles a British military shura. And Barnett Rubin has taken a symmetry of power off the table. So I'll limit my question to one of tactics and strategy. Uh, what the surgical strikes, the targeted killings, the drone warfare. Uh, do you gentlemen believe that that is making US and its Western allies more secure or perhaps more vulnerable? All right, three good questions. Who wants to have a go at um, whether the US, I think this is a geostrategic one for Barney, does the US want to maintain a conflict somewhere in the world to bolster its economy? Well, the uh, effect of the wars of the past uh, decade, decade and a half, has actually been quite negative for the US economy. Um, mm. And uh, in fact, the defense industry does even better when there's no war. Uh, the, so uh, I, that definitely is not the case. By the way, war in the Middle East also causes the price of petroleum to rise, which is detrimental to our U.S. And, and the Indian and other economies. On the question of whether, uh, by the way, Anahita, I did not take, your, uh, what I said was 
that you, the audience, would be most welcome to question asymmetries of power. Our, our, uh, our panel, defined as it is, is about how those asymmetries are exercised. So, um, I don't know, you won't get a second bite of the cherry, as they say here, though. As to whether it makes the United States more safe or not, look, the, the honest answer to that is no one knows and no one can know. Um, one can argue one way or the other, and I have argued the other way uh, at times, but the, real, the political reality uh, for someone who is in a politically vulnerable position and is responsible is that there are tremendous pressures on him, or perhaps at some time on her, uh, to undertake visible actions against enemies. And uh, which are quantifiable, and that is uh, something that, that in my view, unfortunately, biases the policy process uh, in favor of this type of activity. And that's what I meant by capabilities. Is partly also we do this. Of course, we should not have a strategy that is beyond our capability. And one of my problems, having been in government now is I, I'm very hesitant to recommend any policies to the government because I'm aware that it will probably never be able to implement them. Um, but, uh, you know, but part of the problem is when you have the capacity to do these things, it's very tempting to do them. Uh, especially, as I said, because you see a result immediately, which you do not see in negotiations. In negotiations, Every story about negotiations has the same headline except the last one, which is negotiations fail to reach agreement. That's the case absolutely up to the very last moment. In <laughs> so it's not politically attractive. Can I, can I just um, add on to that last question as well? Um, you know, this question of, um, of are, you, are you creating as many uh, or more terrorists than you're killing? Um, I mean, it's... Someone earlier raised, or Barney raised the um, May 2010 uh, attempted bombing of Times Square. It's, it's one piece of evidence, it's one, one episode, but um, the Faisal Shahzad thankfully was, was incapable of setting the bomb off. He was captured, he was brought into to trial, and he gave a sort of semi-famous uh, statement at his trial, which he said that the reason I did this was because of the drone war in Pakistan. Um, it's, and, uh, and, and you know, there are other Faisal Shahzads, no doubt, that right now have been radicalized by the, uh, by the drone war in Pakistan, some in Yemen, some in other places. Um, that doesn't automatically mean um, you don't do it, but it certainly means that this is not nearly as clean and easy as you might think. Um, and it certainly means that uh, there are repercussions to your strategy. Um, so in, in June of 2002, um, Donald Rumsfeld wrote this famous memo and made a good point. And, and just because Donald Rumsfeld wrote it doesn't mean it wasn't actually a good point. Um, it was um, he, uh, he he asked he asked this question of his staff. You know, are we are we um, creating as many terrorists as we're killing? Um, it's still the question. How many years later? Uh, and it is something that should always inform uh, any American and on any counterterrorism strategy. Period. Uh, uh, Mark, unfortunately, that's not exactly what he wrote. He wrote, are we killing and capturing more terrorists than the madrasas and, and that's others? That's one of the, one of the points, yes. 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 There, there's also the, the good point, that, which needs to be made. And I'm by no means an, an advocate of drone strikes. Um, but the drone strikes have been extremely effective at killing a very significant number of mid and senior, in some instances, al-Qaeda operatives mm -hmm. in Pakistan. But, but whether that's, yeah. whether, whether well, they just, it breeds more no, or not, if they, they do take them out. Sure. I think Barney, can, we just, can I get another couple of questions in? Hmm? Do you mind? Or, oh, go on, go on. No, but briefly, the drone briefly. strikes have been very effective in decimating Al Qaeda, and they also may at the same time have helped strengthen the TTP, yeah. sure. because those are two different yeah. types that's of what organizations. I, was say. I completely agree with that huh? view. If you actually are on the ground and you move. Um, through um, the so-called clear, cleared area of SWAT, which is full of the Taliban, full of, you know, it's absolutely never been cleared. Um, and you move into Waziristan and go and look at what's going on in Baluchistan now. They've created a new kind of homogeneity. It's very interesting. Um, there are elements in TTP now who were never before part of the TTP marriage. 
you know, they've come out of Lashkar Toiba. They're even completely different sects who are violently opposed to each other, um, you know, in terms of um, FIQ, in terms of uh, jurisprudence, who, who have got together and, and formed a homogeneity uh, as a result of the drone strike. And I think that's one of the things that you saw with Lashkar Toiba. An element of it went to join uh, with Al Qaeda, and that was actually in response after Red Mosque and Lal Masjid into uh, strategies like the drone strike operation. It's an interesting point. Uh, some questions from the back, please. Can we have from the front? Um, some, who have we got? Go ahead, sir. Uh, do you think intelligence inherently as a profession is more susceptible to offensive use and only works well that way? Or can that same information and analysis be used both for defensive and offensive strategies? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, it, it depends on what you mean by defense and offense. I mean, certainly um, I, 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 intelligence it should be used to inform uh, and, and inform policy for whatever purpose. It should be inform decision making, whether it's decision making about defending a country, not just the U.S., any country, um, or taking you know, offense against an enemy. I think, I think the, the, the where you potentially run into problems, and if you're talking about specifically the, the CIA, um, when the intelligence service is also doing the operations, and that's obviously a, a true of a lot of different intelligence services, um, you have this problem where um, the, the CIA is doing operations like, say, drone strikes. Um, the analysts at CIA are analyzing the impact of the drone strikes. Um, the CIA is grading its own homework. Okay, yeah. and, and, and so that doesn't necessarily sometimes lead for great independent analysis yeah. about these operations. Um, and I, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but that's, I think, one reason uh, that um, there has there not, I don't think until somewhat recently, has there really been um, serious, what they call sort of red teaming, um, counter arguments inside CIA about, about the drone program, in part because it was seen as being very effective, it was embraced by two successive presidents, and um, you know, it, it, saw, it, thought, it was thought to be having an impact. Someone, uh, someone um, in IB said that to me, who'd been stationed in Kashmir for many, many years. He said uh, that one of the, uh, the key reasons behind the dysfunction that existed um, with IB um, and its strategies um, in, uh, in Kashmir was that it, it made the product and it acted on the product. And that cycle with no oversight led to uh, massive bloodshed. I think one impact, I, this is a hypothesis, I'm not sure it's true, but uh, that I uh, I, I, I wonder about is whether the use of drones is linked to the increase in the use of suicide bombings. It, because let's, it has to do with asymmetry of power. Um, because, of course, if um, the Taliban or some other such organization had drones, they would not use suicide bombing. Um, but if they want the capacity to hone in on a target and have a smart bomb, there's no smarter bomb than a human being. So, um, it, it, in a way, it is their asymmetrical response to this type of targeting. For instance, the attack on the shopping mall in Kenya appeared to be very clearly linked to the use of drone warfare uh, in Somalia. So, uh, again, that's a cycle that will be difficult to get out of, but we have to start analyzing. I think we've got time for one more, one more question. No, we don't. <laughs> we don't have time for one more question, which is a shame because there are lots of them. But thank you all for your contribution. Thank you to all my panellists. I've learnt a lot and thoroughly enjoyed myself. Have a very thank you to all of you. Give them a big hand. And we are ready for the next session. Commonality. It was a seamless. Yeah. It was a seamless. <laughs>